the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story. And this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. Away we go. The My Backstory podcast with Jay Dobbins out here in Tucson, Arizona. I am... uh, I get excited about every podcast I do, but this is probably one that I'm most excited about. A um, couple of reasons. Number one, my brother's in law enforcement. Um, most of my friends are in law enforcement. And um, I think like most kids growing up, I had a neighbor. Well, not most kids having neighbors that were uh, part of motorcycle clubs, but you have this fascination with um, outlaw biker gangs and, and stuff like that, mostly because we don't know anything about them. Um, I have so many questions I want to ask you, <laughs> you know, like how that all came about. Um, but I want you to share your story. Um, obviously, I think that will be the the core of our conversation because I think it's fascinating um, that how you infiltrated the Hells Angels and how that all worked. Um, but sharing your story from the very beginning, you know, growing up in Indiana and you know, playing ball at, at University of Arizona and all that. Um, so going into that story and then we'll just take the conversation as it goes. Okay. This is your show, Jay. Take it away. Yeah, right on. I, yeah, um, yeah I, I was uh, born and uh, spent my, my part of my youth, at least, in northwest Indiana, in the region up there. Yeah. I was born in Hammond and um, raised in Highland, just, okay. you know, just across the state line from Chicago. Oh, okay. And, um, man, I... I lived a very uh, sweet, peaceful childhood, yeah. the, the white picket fence childhood. My folks stayed together. My folks were both hardworking, blue collar parents. Yeah. You know, my dad was a construction worker for his entire life. He pounded nails for 50 years. Yeah. My mom was a house cleaner. You know, my mom um, scrubbed people's toilets for a living. Yeah. And um, that that is what me and my sister and my brother were raised in, which was a blue collar work first, play second mentality and providing for your family and, and, and just trying to live a, a peaceful life. Yeah. Do you have siblings growing up? I did. I have a sister that's four years younger than me. And I have a brother who's nine years younger than me. Oh, okay, cool. And then what brought you out to Arizona? Was it football? Uh, no, actually my dad moved us out here when, um, when we were younger looking for work. Um, and, uh, and got a job out here as a carpenter. And so I went to high school and college out here. I went to high school here in Tucson. And then I spent a year at the university of Arkansas, um, and then ended up uh, back at the university of Arizona. And so that's, you know, where my, um, the second half of my youth, like through young adulthood was. Yeah. It's a trip, man. I, uh, small world too. Cause my grandmother was from Boston and then her dad moved him out. He was a carpenter as well, moved to Arizona to Tucson. And, uh, he actually, unfortunately ended up dying on David's month and air force base doing a job, but she graduated from Tucson high. And so, uh, it's just kind of a small world, you know, that, I mean, to what's Tucson, you know, it's like a small town. It's not that huge, you know? Yeah. Right. And that, uh, you know, who knows your dad and my great grandfather probably crossed paths, you they know, they may have been on a job together somewhere. Probably. Right. Probably. So, so you played football your entire life, like growing up, that was like your, your sport. I did. I, I played, um, you know, in the youth leagues, yeah. uh, through high school. Um, you know, I was, I was never very good at it as a kid. Yeah. Um, I loved it. I just, I just wasn't very good at it, to be quite honest. Um, I kind of found my way and found my niche a little bit in high school and um, had a good high school career. I was uh, very heavily recruited out of high school and um, had a, a bunch of college offers and went to the University of Arkansas my first year. Lou Holtz recruited me. Oh, I wow. played for Coach Holtz. And, um, um, you know, at the time, this was 1980. Um, Arkansas and the program there, what coach Holtz had built was what we look at today as Alabama or Clemson or Ohio state. They were a program that was a top notch, uh, nationally ranked program in competition for a national championship every year. So it was, it, it was, it was big. It was, uh, it was, it, you know, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Yeah. 
So like I, uh, I was reading the book a little bit and you were talking about a play that you made uh, where you caught the ball out of bounds and like landed in all these uh, cactuses you know, and like had to spend the rest of the day getting those needles removed from your body. And uh, it kind of highlighted for me, like what kind of guy you must be, you know what I mean? A guy that's going to lay out for a ball like that. It's like, it's a level of intensity that most people probably don't ever have, or don't understand. Well, you know, as a, as an athlete, as a football player, um, when you're not the biggest guy, when you're not the fastest guy, when you're not the strongest guy, you have to find some way to get yourself seen yeah. and, and to compete and to go out there and make your way amongst people who are more physically gifted than you are. Right. And so mine was just through toughness. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to be resilient. I was going to be tough. I was going to be aggressive. Uh, I was going to be reckless. And that is ultimately how I competed, how I kept up with people who were more physically talented than I was. Right. And so once you, you play football, you went to the combine, it didn't work out like the way that you anticipated because um, you thought you were going to be an NFL football player, right? That was the initial goal. I was convinced of it. You know, yeah. I, I had a, um, I had a successful college career. Yeah. I was an all pack 10 wide receiver. Yeah. And I went to the NFL combine with the mentality that, um, I would be drafted and I'd play in the league for eight or 10 years. And if I was lucky enough to be on a championship team, maybe play in a Super Bowl, and then um, retire as a young man and sit at a restaurant that had my name on it at the bar and, right. and uh, tell war stories about how, what an amazing player I was. Right. You know, I had it all figured out at 22 years old. And um, we're at the combine and we're running and we're jumping and we're testing. And I see Al Davis who was, you know, a patriarch of the league that, right. uh, you know, uh, the face of the Oakland Raiders on every level. And I approached uh, Coach Davis and said, hey, man, you know, like I'm, I've always been a Raiders fan and, and I was a Fred Bolitnikoff fan growing up. And how am I doing? And he looked at the score sheet and he said, you're the fastest slow guy I've seen all day today. <laughs> right. And I like it didn't matter. I wasn't right. going to be discouraged. And so, um, you know, we're lifting weights and jumping and running and and going through all those tests that the teams put you through to decide yeah. whether they want you to be a part of their organization. And early on, I got paired up with some guys and I, I, I met one guy, my size, my build uh, was from Cutstown State. And I was like, I, I didn't even know there was such a thing. Right. You know? I've never heard of it. And um, another guy that I was with was from a little school in Mississippi. And I was thinking, man, I'm going to show these guys how we do it. I'm going to show them how we do it in the most dynamic offensive conference in the country. And 10 minutes into the drills, I realized I was going to have to find another way to make a living because these guys I'd never heard of, never seen before. I couldn't keep up with them. Yeah. I couldn't do what they could do. They were absolutely amazing. And I was like, man, what's going to happen when I cross paths with the guys I have heard of? Right. How am I going to keep up with them? I don't need these guys are nobodies. As it turned out, the guy from Cutstown State was Andre Reed, who played 15 years for the Bells and is in the Hall of Fame. The guy from the little school in Mississippi went to Mississippi Valley State. It was Jerry Rice. Yeah. You know, so little did I know it at, you know, 22 years old, I was competing for attention against two of the greatest football players, right? Uh, two of the greatest all time wide receivers to ever put on shoulder pads and a helmet. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't necessarily judging myself against the fairest of competition, yeah. but nonetheless, they could, they, they just could do things that I was not physically capable of. And I had done everything within my power to be prepared for that. Yeah. So that realization hit like, you, like you're going to have to find something else to do, yeah. you know, and our, our, our goals change. That's part of life. Yeah. You know, if our goals never changed, you know, me and you would be sitting here as astronauts or cowboys or something. Mm -hmm. um, our goals change. And um, at the time, the television show Miami Vice was very popular. Right. Uh, not the movie, you know, not Jamie Foxx and Colin Farrell, the old school right. TV show. And I saw Sonny Crockett like wearing that Hugo Boss suit and driving a Lamborghini around South Beach. And, um, meeting with kingpins and negotiating for tons of cocaine that was sitting on some barge out in the harbor and um you know these 
uh, beautiful um, models were like bringing him martinis at the deck of some mansion and sitting on his lap and he was smoking and joking. And I was like, man, I could do that. I yeah. think I can do that. You know, it yeah. was, I was super intrigued by it. I wanted to, I wanted to work undercover. Um, I, I fell in love with the myth of it, yeah. with this um, Hollywood created um, media created urban legend of what the job was. Yeah. Um, once I got on the job, I realized that, you know, the Hugo Boss suit was a pair of cutoff camos and a wife beater t-shirt and flip-flops. And the Lamborghini was an 82 Malibu. Right. You know, and the, um, the mansion was a trailer park with a single wide on blocks and an aluminum awning hanging half off of it. Right. You know, and, and the, the kingpin was some dude, you know, sitting at the corner of a condemned bar with his plumber's crack hanging out who didn't have two nickels to rub together to buy his next beer. Right. And that, that ton of cocaine was, you know, uh, actually an eight ball that was so stepped on with baby laxative, you'd shit before you'd ever get high off of it. <laughs> you know, and the, you know, these gorgeous girls that I saw hanging around the scene on TV, you know, it was some skank with three teeth in her head and tits like sweat socks with rocks on the toes. You know, was the reality of it. Right. And when I saw it in real life, what it really was and got past this, um, this, this myth of what the job was, I loved it. I, yeah. I loved every day of it. I loved when my alarm clock went off in the morning. I was excited to go to work. Yeah. Good days, bad days. It didn't matter. Um, I, I held a a huge sense of uh, pride in the fact that my agency had given me a badge and a gun. And on behalf of the communities that I worked in said, go out there and take care of those people stand in between the predators, stand in between the thugs and the good and innocent people who just want to live a peaceful life, stick up for people. Yeah. Um, when it comes down to it, and, and through some self-assessment and honest reflection, I think the only thing I was ever really good at was standing up to bullies. Right. And I'm not even sure necessarily I was good at it. I was just, I was willing to, I was willing to try. Yeah, for sure. Why ATF and not, um, you know, FBI? Why not, um, you know, DEA or one of the other agencies? ATF had then, has now, the most dynamic undercover program in federal law enforcement. Right. Um, they, uh, they support their undercover operators. They give them freedom to work. Uh, they train them. There's a, a, a legacy of great, great undercover agents who've done amazing things, some known, some unknown, um, in, in, the, in the world of law enforcement. And uh, just through my research and... Um, and then ultimately my experience, it was the right place for me to be because I was allowed to spend, you know, an entire career. I was allowed, allowed to spend 27 years in undercover assignments. That's crazy. And I, it, it, I couldn't have planned it any better. Right. So did you, um, can you go for the, for the listeners, like kind of what your transition was from becoming a brand new agent? And kind of what that story was. I mean, obviously it's gonna be a Cliff Notes version because we you know, it would probably take all day to go through all the awesome things you've done, but like kind of a Cliff Notes version of what that transition was or what that uh trajectory was for you. Well, what you know, what was uh unique to uh my career and different was that I got hired on a Monday. On a Thursday, four days later, I was taken hostage and shot. Um uh the suspect put a gun to my back. Uh, fired a round. The round uh, went in my back. It went through my lung. It narrowly missed my heart. It exited my chest. And, you know, four days on the job, I was laying in the dog shit and garbage of one of those trailer parks I talked about yeah. bleeding to death. There was blood coming out of my chest like you're holding your thumb over a garden hose. It's a, trip. Um, a huge pool of blood was forming around me. And Ultimately, you know, I had great partners who, who resolved the situation. Um, I ended up in the hospital recovering. Um, actually, 
Uh, Richard Carmona, Dr. Carmona was my trauma surgeon who ultimately became the Surgeon General of the United States. That's um, true. I had the best trauma surgeon to take care of me, you know, on the planet. Yeah. Um, so I'm in the hospital and I'm recovering and these liability um, attorneys are lined up waiting to interview me. Yep. And I've still got tubes connected to me and I'm, you know, on a morphine drip and- yep. And these guys are coming in. They're saying, hey, kid, you know what a million dollars looks like? You know, like I said, I grew up with a carpenter and a house cleaner. Right. No idea what a million dollars looked like. How about $5 million? Let me take your case and you will never have to work another day in your life. Yep. The government has created a huge amount of liability for themselves. They put you in a situation that you weren't prepared for. You weren't yet trained for. And you tell me how much money you want and I'll go get it for you. We will never see a courtroom. They will sign a check for whatever you say to make you go away so that they can avoid the scrutiny and the exposure yep. over this situation. And all I could think of to myself was get out. I didn't want the money. No cop um, that I've ever known ever took the job for money, yep. for fame, for fortune. You know, they take it for, uh, for other reasons, for greater good reasons. Yep. Um, that never changed for me. Um, the money was insignificant. All I wanted to do was get well and, and get healthy and go back to work and try again and see if I could do better. Yep. You know, with the feds, we get paid every two weeks. You know, I got shot four days out on the job. I hadn't even gotten a paycheck yet. You know, I had <laughs> a bullet crazy. go through my chest and I had not yet received a paycheck. It was on the house. I comped them that one. That's crazy. And, you know, the fact that I survived it and, wanted to come back um i felt like i was bulletproof yeah i felt like man you know that like I, like there's nothing that can stop me were you married at that time um i was i wow. was and that's that you know that's very uh that's very traumatic for a young wife was she like um, trying to push you out like saying no, no no this probably isn't yeah that's you know no one that would uh that that loves someone or that cares someone yeah. uh to include my parents to include my friends like wanted me to continue that. Yeah. Um, you know, I transferred to Chicago. The attention, the, the shooting was here in Tucson. And because of my football career, it got a lot of media exposure. Yeah. And I wanted to work undercover. I yeah. wanted to, that's what I wanted to do. That never changed. Right. I transferred to Chicago. And a year later, I was in another shooting there. I was in a shooting with some, some gangbangers during an undercover machine gun deal and got run over by a car and shot. And, wow. you know, so two shootings within... 18 months of coming on the job. And, um, I, you know, I was invincible in my mind. I was, th there was nothing that could stop me. And so, you know, for the next 27 years, I, uh, in hindsight, was so hyper aggressive, uh, probably reckless, uh, actually dangerous at times yeah. with how I did the job. But, um, Man, I, I was just looking for opportunities to insert myself into undercover roles in yeah. crime events. Um, I bought everything from dope off the street corner to cartel dope. I bought yeah. everything from Saturday night specials to rocket launchers. Uh, every, like in the IED world, everything from uh, homemade pipe bombs that some tweaker was assembling on a workbench in his garage up to you know, C4 servo activated remote controlled devices, uh, home invasions, murder for hires, um, gang infiltrations. You know, over the course of my 27 years, I was involved in over 500 undercover operations. That's crazy. And, um, some smaller, some bigger, um, some with less involvement, some with deep involvement. But um, I just, I loved it. I loved it. I loved the hustle of pretending to be someone I wasn't having this false persona and then testing that against real life murderers and rapists and drug runners and gun dealers and, and people that uh, by nature were violent and to see if I could do something good. Yeah. Did you ever have the lines um, blurred where I was like, man, I'm, I'm getting in too deep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, on a, on a couple different levels, I think that, um, you never can escape the human factor of the job. 
So you're going to be working against suspects who, when you spend time with them, you find an affection for them. You grow to like them. You yeah. see elements of their personality or character that you're fond of. Yeah. And then you see them do something vile or despicable and you think to yourself, man, you're so much better than that. I've seen you be better than this. And now you've put me in a position that like, I, I have to do something about this. I cannot turn my back to what I just saw or heard or participated in with you. So that causes, you know, that dilemma. Yeah. Um, and then, to, you know, to be quite honest with you, there was a point in my career where I had spent so much time undercover that my persona and my job had stopped being what I did and it was who I was. Um, so, you know, to come back full circle on your question, to clarify a little bit, I don't know that the lines ever blurred for me in the good guy, bad guy yeah. uh, equation. Yeah. I always uh, had solid footing on, on, on what team I was playing for and what I was trying to accomplish. My lines blurred in that um, I started living that gangster persona and living it full time. Yeah. You know, I would come home off uh, operations and be gone for an extended period of time. And my wife would tell me, you, you can't walk in this house and treat me and the kids like we're street suspects. You can't treat us like that. You can't talk to us like that. And then in a, in a self-protection, self-defense role, I would say like, look, I'm not a light switch. I can't turn this on and off. People who dabble in what I do for a living get dead. I have to be fully committed and on all the time. And then her response was, well, when you come to this house, you better install a dimmer switch and turn that shit down because that ain't going to fly here. Wow. You what know? an amazing woman, though, to be able yeah. to like deal with that because that, that had to be tough. Um, my wife is, um, and I say this to, uh, all this time publicly and privately, I have made um, a million mistakes in my life and with her. And she has given me a million and one second chances. Wow. She's uh, way better than I ever deserved. Uh, a way better person than I am. Um, a, a much purer, better heart than I have. And um, like there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of occasions where she should have just said, like, you need to get out and never come back. Um, and she always gave me a second chance. That's awesome, man. What are some of the what were some of the hairiest situations that you that you ever were involved in, where you were like, I don't think I'm getting out of this one. Well, yeah, I think that uh, with time and experience, sometimes situations that um, if you're not in that world appear to be hopeless yeah. are just the next challenge, are just the next. Uh, event to try to overcome. Um, you know, there was an event in the Hells Angels case where I was told by members of the gang that I was going to go commit uh, murders on their behalf and yeah. not asked, you know, told and yeah. said, hey, and you're going to be followed to this location. And when these uh, targets show up, if you don't shoot them, we're going to shoot you. Um, that, I mean, that's a tough dilemma to be in yeah, totally. uh, when you're, when you're operating, you know, independently. Um, luckily I was able to get word out to a cover team and have the, the targets of my murders detained so that they were never going to show up where Smart they were supposed move. to be. <laughs> so I was able to play it in the eyes of, um, my associates that I was there ready to take care of business, ready to kill on their behalf. I, I couldn't control if the, if the targets showed up or not, yeah. um, in their eyes, you know, I was a hero and, and came home to a hero's welcome. Right. Um, and there's situations where you're just, you're confronted on, on whether you're real, whether you're being truthful. Um, the worlds that I operated in that criminal community is uniquely paranoid. They survive and thrive and make money and stay out of prison by being paranoid and by asking questions and being skeptical. Right. Everything you do, everything you say, um, how you walk, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, the motorcycle you ride, how you ride it, um, who you hang out with, where you live, 
the condition of your house or your apartment. All those things are being scrutinized to see if you're real. Right. And they're very good at figuring out who isn't. Yeah. And so, which goes back to my story with my wife, you cannot dabble in this. You cannot play around when you're dealing with like these high-end violent suspects because if they draw a question of you, they're not going to tap you on the shoulder and start asking you questions. They're going to put a baseball bat on the back of your head. That's when you find out that you're no longer believed. And right. that's when it's too late. Right. Did you ever get close to that where like during the course of your investigation where I was like, you thought for sure you were going to get outed? Um, there were times, there were several times over the course of my career where um, it looked close. It was very perilous. Right. And I think that the best undercover operators are the ones that can uh, contain and conceal their fear and their anxiety and turn that into uh, at least the appearance of casualness. Um, if you feel like your life is on the line, if you, if you can somehow be um, uh, nonchalant about that, yeah. um, it adds credibility to you. If, if, if you've been cornered on something, if you've been cornered on a lie and you panic, it reinforces their suspicion that you've been cornered on something that you're uncomfortable with. Right. If you're cornered on a lie and you're casual in your response and you're nonchalant in your response, it defeats that, uh, that mindset that they might have. Like, hey, man, like I just confronted this guy that he's not legit, that he's not real, that I don't believe him. And he just goes back and reinforces what I already knew about him. He didn't seem to be too uh, uh, uncomfortable or intimidated by it. It helps make you uh, believable. And that, that's, that's what you're trying to do. Um, Who gives you that training? Is that something that you go through training to learn how to be that way? Or is that like an OJT type of, a, type of deal? I think both. I, we have training. We put on training for young agents. We try to give them uh, the core building blocks of what they need to survive on the streets. But... Ultimately, it's trial by fire. You have to go through those situations. You have to figure them out. You have to um, uh, establish your routine. Um, you know, and it's and it's like anything. It's like, like you would know, and uh, from your days in the military, man. It's it's better to have a plan and not need it than to need a plan and not have it. Yeah. Um, you know, when I came on the job early on in my in my undercover career, um, there were three situations that I knew. That if I'm confronted with this, I will come out of role and announce myself as a law enforcement officer to try to contain or put an end to this situation. I was not going to watch someone be murdered in my presence. I was not going to watch a woman be raped in my presence. And I was not going to watch a kid be beaten in my presence. For those situations, um, I would have come out of role and done what I could to contain the situation. I figured anything else, I'll figure it out on the fly. Right. And if you do it enough, and if you are successful enough, you gain the confidence to know, and I can get through anything. I can run my hustle and my game on anybody, anywhere. Yeah. You know, I got to a point, I didn't care if you were white or black or Mexican. I didn't care if you were uh, male or female or LGBTQ, or it didn't matter to me. Um, it didn't matter if you were, uh, you know, had an Aryan mindset or if you had a, uh, a militant, like black street gang uh, uh, world that you were operating in, I knew and believed I could run my hustle on you right. and make you believe me and make you uh, understand that who I was and who I was portraying myself to be, this persona, had some value to you. Yep. Do you take any improv classes in order to help with that? Um, I didn't, but I think, you know, every day was an improv class. Um, there was no <laughs> classes today. Lose yeah. your life. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I've been involved in, in some elements of the, um, entertainment business yeah. and, and, and have worked with some actors and talked with some actors and, um, that that's, that's really what you're doing. You're yeah, acting. Totally. Um, you're putting on an act. Um, and, and with a couple of the guys I've worked with, I've, I've told them, I said, the difference is, is that you're acting and I don't have 
some clever screenwriter that can give me cool lines to say. And then if I blow a line, I don't get to call for a cut and try another take with a different inflection, with a different uh, uh, expression. Um, I have to be believed or I'm going to get a straight razor to my throat. Um, And, you know, there's no um, special effects department that's going to come and put squibs on you. And the people pointing guns at you don't have uh, blanks in them with plastic guns. They're real guns with real bullets. It's real life and death. It's real blood. Um, And, you know, that's the difference is that um, ultimately, I guess, in the comparison is that the pressure is you get one chance, one take to get it right. Yep. What was the uh, the draw for you? Because, I mean, um, being that you were married in the very beginning, you became an ATF agent. Like, was that hard for you? Like having to decide like, OK, listen, like I'm going to have to go full in. Like you said, this is I'm not dabbling and being an undercover agent like I am all in. I'm completely vested. Do you have any regrets where that's concerned as far as like you went, you chose the career path over being present, you know, for your family? Um, I have huge regrets on it. And I carry, um, to be honest with you, I carry a huge amount of shame for it. Um, In a nutshell, I put my, uh, my career and my profession and my personal success selfishly in front of my wife and my kids. Um, I take no pride in that. I'm in hindsight and in reflection, I'm ashamed of that. Um, I, uh, at a point in my life, I abandoned my family for my job and for what I was doing. Right. And, um, again, in hindsight, the people that loved me the most, the people that cared about me the most were the ones that I treated the worst. Um, and that is, um, that's a heavy burden to carry. You know, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I believe that, uh, when you ask for forgiveness of your sins, that you're forgiven. I believe that. I think that, um, like the gift that we give to ourselves as human beings is the inability to forgive ourselves and that the regret and the shame that we carry for the things you know, that we've done. And, and I'm 57 years old and I'm trying to learn my lessons. I'm trying to be better. But even today, uh, there's not a day passes where I don't lay my head on a pillow and think about the things I said or shouldn't have said that day, the things I did or shouldn't have done that day. And with regret and oftentimes with shame, and I look at myself, um, And I think that, you know what, Jay, you were supposed to be better than you are. You were like, you had the path set. You had the upbringing and the training and the experience and the parents and the, um, you know, life was staged up for me to be a better person than I turned out to be. Right. Um, And so I failed. I've, I've failed. Um, a lot. What do you mean by being a better person though? I mean, cause like, I think some people would look at that and say like, you went all in on your profession. Yes. As a result, your family suffered. Um, in life, everything's about balance, right? You're trying to find that balance. You want to have a successful career. Um, because in turn you have a, su- a successful career. It helps your family have the life that maybe you want to provide for them. Um, so what do you mean by being a better person? Like what would have been your idea of being a better person, but yet still being ineffective? Yeah. Um, ATF agent. I think that's a great question. Um, I look at pictures uh, of my family, you know, during during this heavy phase of my undercover career. They're at the beach. They're on vacation. They're at Disneyland, um, and I'm not there. And the truth of the matter is, is that I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be with my kids. I didn't want to be with my family. I wanted to be sitting in some tavern, smoking and joking with gangsters, and Uh, chasing some, what now turns out to be false legacy of, of who I believed I was or how I wanted to be remembered. Um, so when I say that, um, I was groomed to be better than that, that's not how I was brought up. 
That's not the, that's not how my father treated me. My father set the example for me of how I should treat my family. And for whatever reason, man, I didn't get that lesson because he was a much better man than I am. I think my son, I believe my son is going to be a, but a much better man than I am. Um, and so, um, I think in a lot of ways as a person, you know, as a son, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, um, oftentimes as a partner, um, I failed um, due to uh, probably my own selfishness. You know, like I said, chasing some false legacy, um, trying to uh, trying to be someone that or, or, or that that I wanted or, or that I wanted to be viewed a certain way by right. people. Right. Um, I never wanted to be viewed as being soft. I never wanted to be viewed as being a coward. And I routinely put myself in situations that I had no business being in. Common sense and logic and reason and experience and training said, don't do this. And I did it anyways, because I was going to show everybody that I wasn't a coward. Right. Um, and in hindsight, when I put myself in those situations, if I ended up leaving whatever that event was in a body bag, I probably had it coming because I made that decision. What I failed to do is I failed to consider like my partners and the people that I were working with who were ultimately responsible for me. If something went bad, the guys that were going to have to crash in and try to resolve it and try to save me. Um, oftentimes those people never crossed my mind. I never thought that they have parents and husbands and wives and kids and friends that they want to go home to. Yeah. I never thought about that. I never considered that. I considered uh, me, what this means to me. Um, I'm going to accomplish this mission. Nothing's going to stop me. Um, and that is uh, regretfully shameful. And anybody out there that's listening in the law enforcement community, if, if you are becoming that person or if you're working with that person, man, do something about it because you will create battle damage in your life, both per personally and professionally, that is nearly unrecoverable from. And you don't need to do that. Right. You can be amazing. You can set the bar and set a standard so high that your peers have to struggle to keep up with you and not crash your personal life and not, and, and not look back at yourself um, with regret. It's possible to do both. Right. What do you think that drive comes from? Where do you think that drive for you came from to want to be like, have this like um, persona or legacy that you were trying to leave? Like, where do you think that was coming from? Cause you don't strike me as a guy that suffers from low self-esteem or anything like that. So it doesn't seem like it was an overcompensation for something. So what do you think it was? I think that um, I uh, I've always, I was taught as a kid to set amazingly high goals and high standards. And I always, uh, set the goals for myself, what I wanted to accomplish, whatever it was I, that I was doing, like up in the stars. Yeah. And when you do that, and when you do that over and over, um, every day for everyday things and for, you know, short-term, long-term, mid-term goals, man, you're not going to reach them all. It's just, it's not possible to reach that level of perfection. And every time I fell short, I felt like I failed. And um, there's nothing more frustrating than personally to feel like you failed and then having people around you tell you how amazing you were. Right. It's like you almost feel like you're being mocked, like you're being teased. Yeah. Um, you know, people, um, and, 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 they, and they say it, you know, like people give me praise. And people um, are, like have uh, oftentimes very kind things to say about me, um, and 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 I like that. That's I mean it's it's, it's nice to hear. Yeah. I mean I mean we like to hear that. But when I look at myself, I feel like I'm counterfeit. I feel like it's a hoax. You know, I feel like a fraud because I'm thinking like I know that you think this was amazing, but I didn't do what I set out to do. Right. I didn't make it where I wanted to go. 
I'm glad you're impressed. I'm flattered that you're impressed. Thank you for that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not impressed with myself. I'm not. Uh, I don't take myself too serious um, because um, short of maybe a few things in life, pretty much everything I've attempted has fallen short of what I wanted it to be. And if you look at it in those standards, if you don't make it, then you failed. Right. What would you say in law enforcement was your greatest success? Oh, my greatest success in law enforcement. In your your eyes? I think that there's, um, I mean, it's easy to cite investigations. I think it's easy to cite investigative accomplishments. Really, um, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is that I was at least smart enough to surround myself with great partners, great investigators who um, ultimately, through their expertise, made me look better. Um, that's probably the one thing that I was truly smart at is that I was good at picking who I worked with. Um, I, I was good at spotting talent. Right. Um, and I, um, I've never been a person who was envious of other people's talents or success. I always enjoyed them. I love seeing people be successful. I love seeing people thrive and do amazing things. Yeah. Um, All the character and personality flaws that I have, I mean, we could sit here for hours and start listing them and talk about them. Um, One of the ones that does not fall into um, that is that I've just, I've never been a jealous or envious person. So when I saw someone who was amazing, when I saw someone who was uh, um, absolutely astonishing great at what they did, I was never threatened by them. I wanted to be next to them. Yeah. I wanted to be with that guy, with that girl, um, and see if I could get some of that to rub off on me. Yeah. Do you have any regrets where your um, profession is concerned? Like things that you wish that you could tell, like kind of tell a younger guy coming through, you know, like, hey, don't do it that way. Do it this way. What would that be? Yeah. Um, I think it's okay in this job to pump the brakes once in a while. I never pumped my brakes. I never touched my brakes. Um, Every day I would cram that accelerator into the ground and just wherever it took me uh, to the point where um, there was a point in my career where not only did I not care if I lived or died, I almost wanted to die at times. Oh, wow. Um, I was almost creating events and seeking situations where I would die. Um, And now like that, I've gotten older and am closer to that event in my life. Now I'm trying to hold it off. Now I'm trying to prevent it. You know, now I'm like, I don't smoke anymore. I barely drink. Um, I exercise every day. I try to take care of myself where back in the day, I mean, I was redlining every day, maxing out on stress every day, smoking and drinking and, and being a wild man. Um, And so I, man, like pump your brakes, pump your brakes. Was it hard not to get caught up in the lifestyle that you were undercover in as far as the drinking and the smoking and stuff? Was there ever a time where I was, I forget who I was talking to, uh, Clark, uh, and Pistato, he's a ex Navy seal, um, frogman 2155, I think is his Instagram handle. Um, he was talking about his undercover work in Phoenix when he was working for Phoenix PD. And I didn't know that undercover police officers can do drugs if the situation warrants them like either losing their life, taking a bullet in the head or them doing this drug. And then they do a contact list or whatever contact yeah. Uh, report. Yeah. I think, um, and, and, and I, and, and, and this, this puts a smile on my face. This question puts a smile on my face because yeah. people think that as an undercover operator, you're never going to make an infiltration. You're never going to get into any depth. You're never going to accomplish anything of significance if you're not out there using drugs. Right. The reality of it is, is that there's lots of criminals, lots of thugs out there who are not drug addicts. Um, And in fact, there's many that I cross paths with that don't drink, don't smoke, go to the gym every day, um, you know, meal prep and get sleep and do all these things and take care of themselves. Um, Now, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, drugs are part of the crime world. If you look at crime in general. Pretty much everything is driven behind the drug game Um, to the point where um, some guy who's stealing 
uh, a purse off grandma's shoulder on the street, some guy who's trying to pry open someone's window and, and do a burglary and steal some jewelry. They're doing that so they can go pawn what they stole and get money and buy drugs. Um, and, you know, those are the lowest levels of it, up to the people who are actually trafficking and distributing for the pure cash value in it. Right. right? So drugs are always present. During the course of my career, I had developed numerous outs to avoid drug use. Right. Um, but people look at some of my accomplishments and they instantly um, maybe are skeptical. Some flat out don't believe it. Like you could not have accomplished this. You could have not have gotten that far without using drugs. Um, I, I don't know what to tell them other than it is possible. And there's people that are amazing at what they do. Right. Um, and yes, if you are um, in a situation and some guy cuts out um, a line of meth on the back of a toilet tank in some men's room and holds a gun to your head and says, you're either going to hit that line or I'm going to shoot you in the head. You know what? Um, I'm going to hit the line. Right. I, I, I'll, I'll work through the back end of that. There's no working through the back end of having a slug in your brain. Right. Um, the reality of it is, is that, um, yeah, there's a procedure to, pers- to report it and to do all those things. And in, especially in today's world, um, any law enforcement manager, who, uh, any supervisor who gets the report that his agent uh, at least did hard drugs during a case, that case is going to end. That case is going to come down. Right. So you better know how to avoid it. You better f- be able to figure out how to um, get around those situations because your investigations aren't going to last very long. Um, right. And then, you know, um, that, you know, that thin blue, blue line between good and bad, right and wrong. For me, it was never a thin blue line. It was always a thick blue line. Um, I knew what was right. I knew what was wrong. If I was, uh, if I was abusing drugs and then thought that it someday I was going to take the witness stand and testify against my defendant, against my suspect, um, how would I do that knowing that I was no better, that I hadn't get conducted myself or lived a life no better than the person I was accusing of the crimes? Right. Um, I never looked back on that uh, like free pass permission as an undercover operator to go and, and act so outrageously that I was worse than the people I was investigating. Yeah. Can you go into uh, the murder that you talk about in the book, in the very beginning of the book? Um, I got a staged, you know, how that all went down, what that whole thing was. I don't know if it's going to compromise any kind of operational security or anything like that. No, it's the, I mean, the story's out there and it's, right. you know, it's published and it's publicized and it's been talked about in, in many uh, venues. Right. Um, you know, from the big picture of it, you know, my view of undercover work was always inaccurate conclusions being formed from accurate observations. Um, my suspects would accurately see me um, in my appearance, in my talk. Um, they would accurately see me in a drug deal. They would accurately see me in a gun deal. They would accurately see me in uh, a bar fight, um, conducting a home invasion, whatever that might be. They would inaccurately conclude that I was a gun runner or a drug dealer or a hitman. When in reality, like we set up plays, we set up skits that we performed in the presence of suspects in order to gain that credibility, in order to gain that belief. Right. I could tell them a million times that I was a hitman, but when I showed them evidence of a murder that they could see and touch, um, man, that you, you, you're overwhelming their senses and you're convincing them. It's really hard. It's one thing to... Uh, dispute someone's account or statement. It's another thing to dispute what you've seen and heard with your own eyes and ears. Right. Um, and so early on in the Hells Angels investigation, I asked the leadership of the charter that I was assigned, um, what are your instructions if I cross paths with a Mongol? And the Hells Angels were at war with the Mongols motorcycle gang yeah. um, and ha- had been you know, in a 30 plus year bloodbath. And my response was, it's your job to kill them. That's what we do. We kill Mongols. 
So I put that information in my back pocket and for two years ran with it, just ran with these guys and, and did every kind of imaginable and unimaginable thing you could think of trying to win them over and gain their trust and gain their loyalty and gain their friendship. In some cases, gain their love. Um, near the end of the case, I told the Hells Angels leadership, I pulled that information that I had for two years out of my back pocket. And I told the Hells Angels leadership, there's a Mongol in Mexico who's running his mouth about the Hells Angels. He's embarrassing us. And I want to go down there. I want to kill him. I want to kill him for the club. Um, that was met with like round enthusiasm, not only like go do it, but here's the gun use this. Here's how you should do it. And so we did, you know, we went down to Mexico and we found a Mongol and we, we duct taped him up and we dug a shallow grave and, um, beat his head in with a baseball bat and shot him in the head and took pictures of it and cut the Mongol vest off his back with the blood splatters on it and brought it back home to Phoenix and showed the hell's angels. We have just murdered a Mongol. A Mongol. Remember two years ago when you told me that's what I'm supposed to do? That's what I did. And the reaction I got from them wasn't shock. It wasn't awe. It was love. It was, you're in the gang now. You're a member of the Hells Angels. You've shown that you got what it takes. You took care of business. We've trained you well. Welcome. What they didn't realize, it was all a hoax. It was all a bluff. Um, the Mongol that we killed in Mexico was actually a living, breathing member of our investigative task force. Mm. We weren't in Mexico. We were in the desert outside of Phoenix. Um, the Mongol cut that I gave him had been seized from another case. Um, a homicide detective built the crime scene for us with cow parts and cow blood to make it look like the victim had been beaten with a baseball bat and shot in the head. And then we photographed it and brought physical evidence back and photographic evidence back and had a well-orchestrated street theater story to present and did it in a very compelling way that we were able to convince murderers that we had actually committed a murder when in reality it was all a bluff. Right. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing that they bought it too, which is awesome. Well, you know, it was, uh, was kind of cool in, in that we had this uh, a homicide detective that helped us. Um, I, I knew what my story was going to be to the Hells Angels before I told it. Right. And I repeated that to the homicide detective. I said, I'm going to tell these guys I beat this guy's head in with my baseball bat and then shot him in the head and buried him in a shallow grave. Build me that crime scene. So having been to, you know, hundreds of murder events, and, and violent events. He knew exactly what it should look like. Right. Um, not necessarily like a uh, Quentin Tarantino or a Tony Scott movie, you know, with, with blood splatters everywhere. Like right. this is what it would look like in real life. So we took this evidence and we photographed it and we documented it. And the homicide detective, before we actually put it in play in our undercover role, took it to his, under, or took it to his homicide briefing and put the pictures out in front of his peers and said, does anybody have any information on this? You know, we've got this body, this unknown body found, and we have no leads on it. And as his homicide peers picked through the pictures and started asking questions to him, he then let them off the hook and said, man, I'm sorry. I just had to play you guys, but we're getting ready to put this in, in play in an undercover role. And I had to have you guys look at it and see it and validate that it looked real to you because people are going to go out. We have undercover agents who are going to put their lives on the line, presenting this information to suspects. And we don't want any questions on whether it appears to be authentic or not. That's so crazy. man, we did our due diligence. We yeah. didn't, this wasn't haphazard. This wasn't something that we invented overnight and decided like, let's give it a try. I'd thought about orchestrating this for years yeah. and had orchestrated a similar type, uh, street theaters on murder for hires many times prior to the hell's angels case that wasn't the first time we used that that ruse so i was uh, you know i was pretty educated in in how to build it how to present it and uh and confident that i could pull it off right how much studying goes into 
an investigation like the one with the Hells Angels? Like how much studying did you do on your end before you went into the deal? Like, is it something that you need to like learning how to dress, how to talk, what bikes to ride, like stuff like that? Well, you know, that's, um, that's a great question. Um, when I was asked to lead the undercover operation, my first response to our case agent was, I can name 10 or 15 agents off the top of my head who will serve you better in this role of what you want than I'm able to. I'm not a biker investigator. Um, I was um, historically in my role, this like white trash, peckerwood, uh, 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 trailer park thug. Right. And, I, and I, that's the role I played. And um, I was very comfortable in it. That's not, that's not necessarily biker. These guys have their own protocols. They live in their own culture, in their own world. And I wasn't familiar with it. And I wasn't necessarily comfortable with it. Um, the case agent convinced me to try. And it went back to earlier what I said in, in our conversation is that I was always willing. I was always willing to try. Um, I wasn't afraid of failure. And so during that process, um, I had to learn. And, 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 and to directly to your question, um, I studied. I studied uh, and observed. Um, I kept my mouth shut a lot. And, and listened and watched and saw how people talked and walked and act and how they dressed and how they rode and how they interacted with each other and mimicked that um, like much like a method actor would yeah. um, mimicked what I saw in the real world. And, um, and I didn't try to, I didn't try to um, pretend to be something I wasn't either. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't an expert motorcycle rider. I surely wasn't uh, a guy who was knowledgeable about motorcycles or a mechanic. Right. And so, you know, these guys who've grown up around motorcycles their entire life, they know every screw, every nut, every bolt, every, every piece of that motorcycle, what it does, what it means, how it functions. I didn't. Right. So when I had trouble and I would ask some simple question like, you know, this is glitching on my motorcycle and they would look at me like, dude, you're supposed to know that. Like, I can't believe you don't know what that means. I would just say to him, man, this isn't what I do for a living, man. Like I didn't grow up around this, man. I'm a debt collector. I run guns into Mexico. I'm not a biker. Um, all I know is that when I turn this right handle, it goes. When I push on this pedal, it stops. When it stops doing that, I bring it to you right. to fix it for me. And it was believable because it wasn't a lie. They yeah. stayed, there was nothing to see through. Right. So that's cool. So you don't, that's not like a pre prerequisite to be a hell's angels, to be like this bike geek that knows everything about motorcycles. It wasn't for me and it wasn't yeah. for the people that I was running with. Um, yeah. if it would have been, um, I would have failed the first day. Right. And I would have never made it through the first week and I would have been dead after the first month. Right. So how did Jaybird come onto the scene? How did that work? Like, how did you, uh, yeah, come on the scene because I mean, I feel like it's uh, one of those things where you're just some guy showing up. Like, how did that work? Well, you know, there are times and there are investigations where you are just that guy showing up. Right. And that's very difficult, really hard to do. Um, I had a head start because I had already been working undercover cases in Arizona and in the Bullhead City area. Right. Um, and I had an established criminal reputation already floating around town, already floating in those circles that this cat Jaybird always had a lot of money in him and he was doing collections for people out of Vegas and he was running guns into Mexico. And so when the opportunity came, like I was actually able to hit the ground running. Yeah. Um, there were two events, two significant events that really pushed us into the Hells Angels. I, I'd, I'd been on the periphery of them for an extended period of time for months without ever targeting them. Um, and then um, a woman named Cynthia Garcia was murdered um, in the Hells Angels Mesa Clubhouse. Um, she was brought there for a party. Um, the party got out of hand. Uh, she was uh, basically beaten to death, boot stomped to death or to near death on the floor of the Mesa Clubhouse. And then some uh, members wrapped her up in some carpeting and stuffed her in the trunk of a vehicle and drove her out in the desert uh, east of Phoenix, east of Mesa, out in Apache Junction. 
right. and cut her head off. Oh, wow. um, those people who were involved in that crime were loose associates of mine in my, in my undercover role. Right. Then um, in April of 2002, the Hells Angels and the Mongols got into a full-on like prison yard quality riot brawl on the floor of the Harris Casino in Laughlin. Um, you know, I had been running with these guys and had uh, built some friendships and established a reputation with them prior to that casino riot. My undercover house in Bullhead City was directly across the river, directly across the Colorado River from Laughlin. You could see the Harris Casino from my backyard. Oh, wow. Um, to the point where I had established uh, a friendship with these guys, um, an association with them. So when that brawl took place, you know, after the riot, I had Hell's Angels coming to my house to hide out, to stash guns. Yeah. Um, and that was the impetus, the kickoff, the Cynthia Garcia murder and the Laughlin riot, which really kicked our focus into the Hell's Angels to decide uh, and to ferret out um, who's shot calling the violence, who's behind this, who's, you know, there was at the time, literally hundreds of Hell's Angels in Arizona that yeah. they, they had saturated the state. Not every Hell's Angel um, and, and still not every guy who has a Hell's Angels patch on his back is a murderer or a rapist or a drug dealer or a gun runner or a gun runner. Yeah. Um, it was, it was my job. It was our job to find out who's who. Um, if I was crossing paths with people who didn't have violent tendencies, who weren't involved in criminal activity, they didn't, I didn't have an interest in them. I, I, I wasn't, I, I kept an association with them for credibility purposes, but I wasn't on the chase for those guys. I was looking for the people that were uh, violent, the people that were involved in drugs and guns. Um, and then to see, like what, if anything, I could do about it. Right. When do you know um, that investigation is done? Like, when do you know that your job is done and it, it, it's time to call it? Man, that's such a tough question for me because for me, it was never done. Right. For me, the investigation was never over. Um, uh, if you're a case agent, if you're a supervisor, there's a certain time where you look at an investigation and you say, we have enough evidence we have the right defendants to go forward and move for an indictment and then go out and arrest people and execute search warrants and deliver a case to the attorneys and seek a prosecution. Yeah. Um, as a case agent, as a supervisor, that time comes. For me as an undercover operator, and again, uh, probably one of my flaws is that day never came for me. I always wanted and felt like I could do more. Um, every rung that I climbed up the ladder, there was always another rung. I'm like, let me go. I can get to the next level. I can right. get to this guy. We haven't, we haven't uh, built a strong enough case against this guy yet. I'm right there. I'm right on the verge of it. Let me go. Let me run. Yeah. Um, when the um, Hells Angels case was closed, when the, when the supervision and the case agent felt like um, they had gotten what they needed, um, and decided to shut the case down. I was pissed off. I was so angry um, because I wanted to keep going. Yeah. I didn't want to stop. Um, I felt like I had really was poised to do the biggest amount of damage that I could do. And it was all taken away from me. And I had nothing to say about it. Um, my argument didn't matter. Um, people with more influence um, and, and more responsibility in the case were the ones making the decisions. Um, and I was just, man, I was so pissed off. In hindsight, those people probably saved my life. Yeah. In hindsight, they probably saved my life because I never could have quit. I never could have pulled myself out. I never could have stepped away on my own. And when I was forced away, and then after, actually after an extended amount of time, and after some honest reflection, I realized, man, those guys saved my life because that was a mission I wasn't coming home from. Right. Why do you say that, though? Why do you think it was a mission you would have, wouldn't have come home from? Because um, ultimately, um, it would have caught up with me, the lifestyle, uh, the speed that I was living at. Um, there were eight or ten associates of mine uh, during that case 
who had been murdered. Right. Um, I was in the middle of it, man. We were in the middle of that violence tornado um, right. every day. Um, it wasn't getting uh, better. It was getting worse. Um, and then just the fact that you're riding motorcycles on a daily basis with people who, um, man, everywhere they go, they go 100 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, if these guys want to go out for a carton of milk, man, they're doing wheelies to go do it. Right. Um, I had gotten to the point actually where I've, I I believe that I'd gained the trust and confidence and loyalty of the members. I believe that um, they loved me to the point where they would have stepped in front of a bullet for me. Um, but no one can uh, stop you from wrapping your motorcycle around a telephone pole. Sure. It was coming. Yeah. It was coming. How do you break the news to uh, the people that you've been investigating or do you, or you just walk away, you just get pulled out and then you just disappear. Um, you know, there's times when the undercover actually gets arrested with the suspects in order to try to maintain or prolong a cover. Yeah. Um, you know, the, um, the arrests were made, uh, for a while, the angels thought that I was on the run. I was actually getting telephone calls from hell's angels the day of the arrest days after the arrest telling me, man, lay low, stay on the road. We're getting hit. You know, they thought that I was on the road. Right. Um, they're smart guys though. Ultimately they figure it out and they figure it out probably sooner than the average guy. Um, those people that I was dealing with, those, uh, those criminal elements, they may not be book smart guys. They may not be college educated, uh, uh, formally educated people. Right. But man, those cats have their PhDs in, in the street. Yep. They, are, uh, they have doctorates in violence and intimidation. They figure things out pretty quick. They know what time it is. And pretty soon it was like, hey, man, everybody's wrapped up here again, but Jaybird, you know, and they, they started figuring things out pretty quick. So do you have any issues or apprehensions about your own safety and your family's safety being that you were in that huge investigation, you're out in the open. Now you've written a book, you've been on a couple of podcasts and, um, and so people know who you are. Um, do you have any concerns for your own safety or your um, family's safety? Well, yes. I, like I'm always concerned. Um, I, I, I live with concern. I've seen firsthand what these guys are capable of. And I know uh, they're some of the roughest boys on the planet. I know what they're capable of. Um, I don't live in fear um, because if I live in fear, they've won. Now they're controlling my life. Like I'm not the bad guy. I was not the one out there murdering and raping and and selling drugs and running guns. Um, like, like if, if, if I live in fear, they control me. Right. Um, so I live my life. I don't, uh, I don't put myself in situations that I shouldn't be in. I don't go to places that I shouldn't be. Um, I'm careful about who I associate with. Um, I'm careful about where I go, but, but I live my life, yeah. you know? Um, I actually wrote my book in part um, to defend myself. I wrote No Angel in part to defend myself. Um, murder and violence threats had uh, stacked up, credible, like verifiable. Uh, there was three murder contracts that had been issued on me. The Hells Angels held one. They had farmed one to the Aryan Brotherhood. They had farmed one to the MS-13. Uh, they had farmed one to 18th Street Gang in Los Angeles. Wow. Um, all that were active. Um, there were threats out there to uh, find and uh, torture and kidnap my kids. Right. There were threats out there to uh, kidnap my wife and videotape her gang rape and make me watch it. There was a plan out there to uh, inject me with the AIDS virus. Um, uh, the uh, ATF, the agency said, you know what, dude, you're on your own. We cannot investigate all these threats. We cannot chase these organizations. They're too big. There's too many people. You're on your own to figure out how to defend yourself, which in part was the motivation that I used to write No Angel. I was like, okay, like I don't have any resources. I'm on my own. I'm going to have to figure this out myself. I'm going to hide in plain sight. I'm going to draw attention to what happened and at least try to cause some pause in the minds of people that intend harm on me. Right. And, and let everybody know what happened and who's who in the zoo. 
Um, in August of 2008, my house was burned to the ground by arsonists. We lost everything. The investigators who uh, came out, you know, concluded, they said this was a failed assassination attempt. Um, this was clearly someone um, either in or associated with that organization who tried to kill you. Um, but you know what? That's to some extent, to some extent, I don't entirely uh, agree with the agency's uh, take on that, but to some extent, it's the cost of doing business. If you are going to accept an undercover assignment and then you're going to uh, infiltrate an organization that is like a known international violent crime syndicate, if you think you're going to step away from that with no repercussions, you've lost your mind. These guys ain't going to change their stripes for me or for anybody else. That's who they are. Right. They're not going to become someone else. They're not, these aren't the types of people who, like, when you catch them dirty, when you catch them with their hands in the cookie jar, are going to say, you know, gosh darn it, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. They're yeah. going to do what they do. Yeah. Um, and so, it, 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 to some extent, it is the cost of doing business. And you know what? Um, no one held a gun to my head and made me work that case. Right. No one forced me like no one in ATF or any other agency I've heard of ever forces anyone to work an investigation that they don't want to work. Right. Um, because if, if you're being forced into an undercover role that you're not comfortable with or that you don't want to perform in and you're going to be dangerous, you're not going to be good at it. Yeah. You have to want to live in that world. And I did. And I accept that. And I, um, you know, there were some things that happened to me behind my agency that, uh, that I don't agree with. Um, but I don't blame anybody. Right. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I especially don't blame anybody for the threats that came to me. I, I, I have some blame. I have some heartache for the way they were handled, yep. but I don't blame the hell's angels for threatening me. That's what they do. I don't make excuses for them. They don't make excuses for themselves. Yeah. Are they what they once were? Are they as powerful as they once were? In your opinion, um, you know, um, bigger and stronger. Wow. You know, Operation Black Biscuit and Jay Dobbins were nothing more than a speed bump on the Hells Angels Highway, right. to be quite honest with you. I would love to flatter myself and say, like, oh, I put a lick on them and I damaged them and I changed their path. Um, they're stronger today than they were when I investigated them. They have more members today than they did when I investigated them. Right. They're thriving. They're surviving. Um, to be honest with you, they don't give a rat's ass about me or what I did to right. be, to be quite truthful about it. Um, the hell's angels are much bigger than Jay Dobbins, much bigger. They're Americana. Right. They're the hell's angels are part of the American culture. They're part of our history. Um, from their origins, uh, you know, up through, uh, Altamont, um, you know, through the, you know, the, 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 the drug running craze and the, and the, and the angel dust craze and the LSD craze of the sixties and seventies, like up through the methamphetamine manufacturing, uh, uh, patterns that were taking place in the nineties where they were cooking, you know, they, they you know, the angels were cooking the best meth, yeah. you know, then the cartels figured out like, man, wait a minute, we got these bikers and these hillbillies cooking meth. We can make meth better than then these guys can. We're the masters of drug manufacturing. Right. And then they started importing. And then, you know, then all these people who were then at one point cooking are now distributors because they've got the street connections. Yep. You know, Joe Cartel down in Mexico might be able to cook the, mes the best meth in the, in the world, but you still got to have someone to sell it to. You got to have someone to sell it for you and someone to sell it to. Right. Um, so. So do you ever question that then as an, as an agent for the ATF? Do you ever question like, your role in that, I mean, you went all in on it, but it was just a small speed bump for the, for the, you know, Hells Angels as, as an organization. Do you ever question like, man, that was a lot I put out for just a little bit of return. There was um, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of personal damage. Ultimately for me, a lot of professional damage came behind that case. Um, but to answer your question, do I question it? Um, if not me, if not the people on my task force, then who? Who was going to step up and check these guys? They'd right. been in existence for, at that point, uh, nearly 60 years. Yeah. 
people had made runs at them, not very successful ones. Um, and, and, and not that we're the only ones that did it and not that we're the only ones that were successful at it. But if not us, who was going to do it? Right. You know, I tell people all the time, people say, Hey, would you do this again? You know, you got shot your first week on the job. You got shot again a year later. Um, all the violence, all the destruction, all the personal battle damage, like what you did to your family, you know, your career, you know, is in shambles, all those things. Would you do it again? And I think like, yes, I would. I would do it better. I would do it cleaner. I would be more efficient in it. I would be more smart in it. But if not me, or if not the people who do what I do, who's going to step up and challenge these guys? Right. You know, is your dentist going to do it? You know, is, uh, is the guy that's working at the convenience store going to do it? Is your auto mechanic going to do it? Is your landscaper going to do it? Who's going to do it? Right. Who's going to step up and go toe to toe with these people if those of us in the um, law enforcement community don't do that? And, and I think the same thing can be said uh, for people from your world, yeah. from the soldiers. Um, if you guys don't get on ships and planes and go over to another country and confront ISIS and confront Islamic terrorism, who's going to do it? Who's going to stop it? Right. Is, am I going to stop it? I can't do it. Um, is uh, Canada or Great Britain or Australia or any of the number of allies that are going to, you know, that we have, are they going to do anything about it? No. You know what? It comes down to us. It comes down to people like you. It comes down to your peers, young men and young women who are saying like, you know what? I will go over there um, at the risk of death, at the risk of never being able to fulfill my life, never being able to see my family or my kids again. And I will put my life on the line so that world does not come onto our, into our territory, into our country. Totally. Um, and I think that, you know, many, many, many of those people who lost their lives over there, uh, would do it again, knowing that. Yeah. I agree with you. Knowing all that and knowing what you know from, uh, all your years in the ATF and the things that you went through, would you want your son to do it? Well, man, my son has a criminal justice degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and Man, I could not, with a clear conscience, encourage anybody to go into law enforcement today. Um, there's never been a harder time where law enforcement is more scrutinized, where they're more unfairly judged, where they're more uh, disliked and hated by at least elements of society, elements of culture. Yeah. Um, I couldn't encourage anyone to do it. And by and not encouraging to someone to do it, I would also say, man, it's the greatest thing you could ever do. Right. You know, I'm basically saying, don't do it. But if you do it, oh my goodness, you're going to have an amazing career. You're going to have an amazing time. You're never going to get rich. You're never going to get famous. You're never going to have a lot of money in the bank. There's other jobs that you can do um, that are going to be much easier and more peaceful for you. Right. Um, uh, man, choose something else other than being a cop. Choose something else other than being a soldier. Right. Um, you're going to have more money in the bank. You're going to have a bigger house. You're going to have a better car. You're going to have an easier time putting your kids through school. You'll take better vacations. You'll have a second house. Choose something else. Yep. But for those people who that is not their motivation, I have like... I don't have a big enough vocabulary to describe my respect and my admiration for them because they're saying, yeah, I'm turning my back to that because I want to do something for the greater good. I want to make an impact on the world. I want to change the world. Um, I want to take care of those people who can't or won't take care of themselves. I want to do that for them. Yeah. So you'd be okay with it then if Jack was like, hey, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, I, I would be. And, and I think ultimately he probably will end up there. Um, yeah. I think his, at least his short-term aspirations are to join the military. I think he has, uh, 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 I know, I don't think, I know he has a, uh, a mentality of service, a mentality of, of, of doing what he can or what he's capable of to help take care of people. Yeah. Um, not everybody has it. Um, I do not look down on the people that don't have it. 
but I do up, look up to the people that do hold that. Awesome. So what do you think, um, moving forward, like for you, like what are your biggest goals and your aspirations now that you're out now that you're done? Oh, my goals are, um, they're probably much simpler than they ever were before. Yeah. I don't know. I like kind of laugh at myself. I don't know that they're any more attainable. I would like to, um, on the biggest picture, on the biggest goal, um, I would like to live a life that is flattering to God. I would like to live a life that is pleasing to God. Um, I fail in that quest every day. I do something stupid or something wrong every dang day that I think God um, on some days shakes his head. I think on other days, he simply just has a tear roll out of his eye when he looks at me. Um, But that's my goal. That's my goal. It's pretty simple. Can I live a better life? Can I become a better person than I've been? And can I live a life that um, honors God, that pleases God, and that gives him uh, credit for anything I accomplish, anything I'll ever have. And then in turn, can I like be a big enough man to accept the blame um, for my own mistakes without making excuses? Right. If I can do that, um, and that might be the most lofty goal I've ever set for myself, if I can do that, then, um, then, then, I'll, then I'll be at least achieving, at least moving in the right direction. Right. Is there anything that you think, well, for, I want to ask you a couple questions about ATF real quick. So when you got done with that investigation, you mentioned that your career took some hits as a result. What were those hits and why? I was uh, frustrated, angry. Um, like I said, I don't know if I have a big enough vocabulary to describe uh, the disappointment that I had when the threats and the violence from the people that I investigated on the agency's behalf came on me and came on my family and my family and ATF turned their back to me. Um, I didn't take that well. I didn't take, I didn't take that lying down. Um, and to be honest with you, ATF should have known better because they known that I've never been afraid of a bully right. and I've never been intimidated. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't intimidated by the agency. I wasn't intimidated by the power and might of the department of justice. Um, and I, I took the fight to them. Right. Um, it ultimately, whatever reputation I had left, whatever was left that, or anyone that was left that had anything flattering to say about me was gone. It evaporated. Um, I had, I'd called their baby ugly, you know, and done it in a very public way. Right. Um, people who, um, I was committed to people who I trusted, who like held a part of my heart, um, wouldn't look at me, you know, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't send a text message, wouldn't give me a call. Um, people who I loved, people who I'd run through a block wall for people who I would stand or would have stood in front of a bullet for, um, didn't care enough about me to send me a text message after my house got burned down. Um, and so that was, you know, that was pretty eye opening, and it yeah. was, it was, uh, it was heartbreaking. It was crushing. Um, and I look at that and I look at like how pathetic I felt and oh, boo hoo, poor Jay Dobbins, like he deserved better. Um, someone should have taken care of him. Someone should have loved him. And then I look at myself and I'm saying like, you're pissed off that ATF abandoned and betrayed you. You're holding them to a standard that you didn't even hold yourself to. I abandoned and betrayed my own family in this. I, I wasn't treated any different by ATF. Then I treated my own wife and kids. And so um, I, was pro- I was probably holding the agency to a double standard. I was holding the agency to a standard that I, haven't, that I hadn't lived up to in my personal life. Oh. Um, in hindsight, I realized that. In hindsight, I, I have a better understanding of it. Um, I don't think I could have done it any differently. I don't think that I could look my wife and my kids in the eyes if knowing that their lives had been threatened and, 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 and not just threatened, but threatened um, by verified credible threats, people who are perfectly capable of pulling out their threats. And in fact, that they, 
they did, you know, attack us and burn our house down. Right. Um, if I didn't do something about that, I would never be able to look my wife and kids in the eye. Yep. I would, be, I would have been ultimately a coward in their eyes. And I was willing to lose or die trying to not be viewed as a coward by them. So what did you want to do to fix it? What was the fix for you? I mean, is there anything that ATF could do differently as far as from an outsider's perspective, like for me looking in on it, it's like, I feel like ATF should have some things in play for their undercover agents, kind of like they have for presidents, kind of like they have for people who are in public office where it's like they have protection even after they're out of office, you know? And it's like, I, why can't they provide that for undercover agents as well? I think it's warranted. There's uh, you know, the, the, what happened to me and um, how I was treated it's not a standalone story. It right. happens all the time. Right. It's happened to many, many dozens of my peers right. who've uh, gone through similar, maybe not quite that grievous of events, but right. similar events. Um, agencies, ATF, and, I, and I'm not going to single out just ATF. I think most federal agencies are not equipped to deal with a situation like that, even though those situations keep recycling and they keep appearing. They're not equipped to deal with them. And I, part of it is because the people that are in leadership, the people that are in executive positions, never lived those lives. They took a different path to get to their position of being a shot caller. Right. So they never had to experience it and they don't know what to do. And when they're confronted with it, um, they're, in my opinion, they're ill-equipped. Yeah. And the agencies, uh, the leadership of, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, single out ATF because I can't speak universally. Um, they're, they, they don't want to say we did something wrong. We made a mistake. We failed. Can you help us fix this? Can we get with you so that, so no one else has to go through this again? Yeah. Can we um, talk to you and talk to your peers um, and talk to the people that understand this world? And can we put something in place so that we can, better help you that we can be better equipped better prepared to deal with these situations when they come up yeah. they would rather just stick their head in the ground say we did nothing wrong and wait for the next one to arrive and that in my opinion is not only bad management it's corrupt management it's criminal management right when you're not willing to step up and take care of the people who've made the near ultimate sacrifice for you short of giving their life They've, yeah. they've, they've almost given their life. Um, they've, and many times they have given their, their personal and professional life, uh, for the executives of ATF or an agency to turn their back on those people and, um, and discard them, um, and then go beyond that to minimize them and to humiliate them. Um, man, it, it feels criminal. Yeah. I mean, I seen. Have you seen the movie Body of Lies? I have. Yeah, so it reminds me kind of of that. You know what I mean? Where like he is giving his life for for his profession, and to know that like he saw behind the scenes shots were being called behind his back that he didn't even know about, and putting his life even further into jeopardy. And then it's like, hey, we're off him. He's on his own. Well, you and know? that's you know ultimately that's what I saw uh, in the investigation and the research of what had happened to me. Um, I saw behind the curtain. Yeah. You know. For years, um, I loved and adored and served, you know, uh, this Wizard of Oz vision of, of what my leadership was and what ATF's headquarters was. Um, and I respected it and I admired it. I, I didn't always agree with it, but I knew that I had bosses and I knew they had a job to do. Yeah. And then ultimately, when I saw like who they really were and how they really conducted themselves, when I looked behind and pulled back the curtain on Wizard of Oz, it's just some little troll in there, like pulling levers, and he had no idea what he was doing. Yeah. That has to be completely disheartening and disillusioning, you know, where it's like, man. I it is. And you know what the thing is? There's amazing managers out there. There's great supervisors. There's yeah. people out there who like have the knowledge, and they have a great heart. And they're in position, but they're, they're outnumbered, and they're overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, and, and like, I, I don't, uh, I don't hate ATF. I love ATF. Yeah. I love the men and women out there with their boots on the ground. I, my, my affection for them 
never waned. Um, I love uh, the great supervisors out there, the great managers. I, I worked for many who, like I said, I'd run through a block wall for. I would jump off the Empire State Building for if they asked me to. That's how much I believed in them. Right. My heartache was caused by a handful of uh, super powerful people, a perfect storm of incompetence um, that arrived in my life and other people who knew that these people uh, that were uh, affecting me, that were damaging me, that were out to harm me were criminal, yeah. uh, rallied around them to protect them because I wasn't in that club. Yeah. Sucks, man. I think that that's uh, I mean, I think a lot of us in our daily lives or work lives, you know, a, a lot of people come to that conclusion, you know, when you see people that are give their whole lives for a profession and then they walk away and it's like, they're just replaced. Like there's no, even it's like the next day they're, they're replaced, you know, and, and you kind of start to question like, man, what am I doing, man? I'm giving my heart and soul to this thing. And for what? Well, you know, like I, for years believed that I was leaving a legacy, right? I wanted to establish a legacy. I wanted to establish a legacy of toughness. I wanted to establish a legacy of courage. Right. I wanted to be remembered as a guy who like never said no to, to investigations that other people didn't want to touch. They were afraid to touch or thought impossible. I wanted a legacy to be like that dude always said yes. He always went into battle. Yeah. Um, the reality of it is, is that in the end, when it was done, my legacy was my name like in a Sharpie marker on the back of a stapler on someone's desk that got thrown in the garbage. In the end... I realized that after everything and after everything that I believed in, uh, to the people that I served, I had become nothing more than a stale French fry in the bottom of their happy meal bag. That's, that's how much they valued me. That's how much they currently value me. Wow. The trip, man. Um, what would your definition of success be? For me personally, success would be, uh, the fulfillment of my goals. Um, now, if your uh, if your goal is to uh, I don't know if your goal is to walk on Venus and you only make it to Mars, did you fail? Um, I think you did. In my world, right. that might be skewed. Right. If I'm like, hey man, I'm going to be the first man to walk on Venus, dude. You didn't make it, man. Your ship didn't make it. You didn't have enough gas. You're going to have to stop at Mars. It's going to have to be good enough. Everyone's going to say, dude, oh my God, you walked on Mars, but you didn't want to walk on Mars. You wanted to walk on Venus, man, and you didn't make it. Yeah. So success for me is the achievement and fulfillment of your goals. Um, I think one of my problems, um, and it's a double-edged short, it, it will, you know, it will either kill you or it will allow you to live is perfectionism. Um, like, like I always try to be perfect in what I'm doing. Um, although that is uh, in, in many, if not all circumstances, something that's impossible to achieve. Right. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a blessing and it's a curse. People that are perfectionists are, are blessed with perfectionism. They're cursed by perfectionism. Oh yeah, totally. Was well, that something that you like tried to bleed out into your kids as well to be like, not perfectionist, but to like strive for goals and to achieve them. And I did. Um, and I, um, ultimately in hindsight, I damaged them in the process. I can see it now in them. Oh. Um, I should have seen it earlier, you know, um, when Jackie was a kid, um, doing his homework, you know, I'd see him doing his homework and erasing a word and rewriting it and erasing a word and rewriting it to the point where he'd like wore a hole in the paper. I said, Jackie, what are you doing? It's like, I'm trying to write this word, but it doesn't look like I'm right. I'm trying to do it just right. Like a good father, a wise father would have said, dude, write it the best you can write it and then let that be. And that can be good enough. Yeah. That's what a wise father would have done. That's what a good father would have done. For me, uh, wisdom is something that always came to me right after I needed it. <laughs> I never had it when I needed it. You know, right. it always came afterwards. Right. I can see that now uh, with my daughter, like everything she does, she's very meticulous with everything she does um, to the most finite detail. Um, and I should have been telling her the same thing. Yeah. Just whatever it is you do, 
Do it the very best you can do it in that very moment. And then let that be good enough. Yeah, for sure. What are some of the lasting impacts on you from your investigative work? Oh, man. Um, I'll tell you this. Uh, living the life I lived, seeing the things I saw, interacting with the people I interacted with, um, it changed my DNA. It altered my personality. It altered my character. Um, I am a completely different person than I was when I came on the job. I actually had uh, an old partner uh, in a conversation last week. It's interesting that you brought this up. He's like, Jay, he goes, you know what? When you came on the job, man, you were so fun loving and you were so silly and you were so goofy and everything was a laugh. And he goes, some, some switch flipped somewhere along the way. He's like, dude, you became a dark person, man. Yeah. Um, and that wasn't uh, said to me to insult me. It was a statement of fact. Right. Um, and I can deny it and I can say, oh man, that like, no, I'm not like that. I'm still that guy. The reality of it is if I'm going to do honest self-assessment, this job changed my DNA. Yeah. It rearranged my chromosomes, man. Yeah. Um, can you ever get it back? Do you think, is it one of those things that if you were to do enough, you know, self-help work or whatever it would be, I, I don't know. Um, do you think you ever get back to that fun, loving Jay that he remembers? Oh man. I, you know, I would love to, I don't know if I can, um, um, I don't know if I have the millions of dollars it would take in counseling to get there, to be quite honest with you, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Um, I could see that. I see it in my brother. I see it in my buddies who are cops. Um, there's a lot of people from outside of that world that uh, are very quick to pass judgment on police officers or federal agents that are doing this kind of work that are very jaded. And, uh, and it changes you. I think the job changes you, um, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. Would you say that you're a lot more jaded now than before you oh, got onto the profession. Yeah, hugely, hugely. I um to be quite honest with you, earlier in my life, even like through the early parts of my career, I trusted everybody. Yeah. Um, I trusted everybody. I trusted the crack dealer I was dealing with to bring me a crack rock. Right. You know, hey, right. I'm talking with you. We're negotiating. You might not bring it on time, but ultimately, man, I trust you, man. You know, you're gonna bring me a crack rock. Now I don't trust anybody. Right. I don't trust anybody. I develop relationships that have trust in them. I have um uh, but I, I continue to believe in people. I continue to believe in the nature of people and the goodness of people. And that that is, um, ultimately how God made us. Um, but man, it's like really hard for me to trust people anymore. Yeah. It's really hard for me to let my guard down anymore. Yeah. That's, a, that's tough because, uh, I think a lot of people, not just in law enforcement, but in life, right. You have experiences that, that go, that happen throughout your, the course of your life. And you have a hard time trusting people. You have a hard time letting your guard down because you, you're just waiting for that, that rug to be pulled out from underneath you, you know? And it's like, that could be a, det a detriment, you know, because you, you lose the ability to make good connections with people because your lack of trust, you know? But sometimes I would say for myself, it's, it's been a uh, safety mechanism, if you will, survival mechanism. Sure. You know? and, of course. What has once been seen can't be unseen. Right. What has once been heard can't be unheard. Right. What has once been experienced can't be unexperienced. Um, and so I sit there and I hold the world to this standard of, you know, like, oh, I don't trust you. Well, um, I don't have to look very far. All I got to do is look at myself. Um, look at look at the things I did to my family. Like, I'm asking them to trust me. Um, and I spent a big part of my life giving them, like, good, valid reasons not to trust me. Right. So am I being a hypocrite? You know what? I probably am. I probably am. And that's not a very flattering statement to make either. Right. Well, sometimes everything, they say everything is a projection, right? So what, the way we feel the most sometimes is something that we're just projecting out from our own psyche, you know, but I don't know. Um, do you think that you'll ever get to a place with your family that you can like where it's all made up where you guys are good to go? Um, you know what? They, um, they, they work really hard for me. They try really hard. That's awesome. Uh, they try really hard for me. Um, you know, like uh, after my after my house was burned down, um, the house is still smoldering. There's still like literally smoke coming off the embers. And my son, Jackie, was in the backyard and um, he's probably 10 years old at the time. And he's got a, a carpenter's hammer in his hand. He's walking around. He's pacing around the backyard with a framing hammer. And I said, Jackie, what's up, man? What's up with the hammer? And he said, Dad, he said, what if they come back and try to hurt mom? You're never here. I got to be ready to do something about it. Mm. 
it's a freaking, that's what I did to a 10 year old boy. Uh, um, you know, uh, during the case, during these, during my undercover career, you know, I would, to, to be quite honest with you, right. And this is a very unflattering statement, a very unflattering story to tell. I would come home and I would do the bare minimum I had to do to serve my family. I'd mow the grass, pay the bills, uh, pat the kids on the head, have a cup of coffee with Gwen. And I couldn't wait to get back on the street. Couldn't wait to get back out there with the thugs because I was changing the world, man. I had this hero syndrome and I was like impacting people's lives. and I was making things better for people. You know, I really believe that. I had given myself to something bigger. Um, and when I would leave, Jackie would run out in the yard and he'd get a rock and he'd give me a rock. You know, for years, he'd given me these good luck rocks. Uh -huh. And I collected them. I kept one in my pocket at all times. I had them in the saddlebags of my undercover motorcycle. I had them in my undercover car, the undercover house. I was handing them out to members of the task force saying, man, we're surrounded by violence. We're surrounded by just despicable characters doing evil, wicked things. And here we are. We're thriving. We're surviving. Keep Jackie's rock with you. There's some kind of good luck blessing this kid's putting on these rocks. I can't explain it, but keep one with you. So I come home and right before we went to fake the Mongol murder that we had talked about earlier, yeah. I'm in the driveway, my motorcycle's idling and Jackie runs up, dad, don't leave yet. And he brings me this rock and he puts it in my hand and it was shaped kind of like a heart. He said, dad, this one's special. I've been saving it for you. So I'm a 40 plus year old father and I'm trying to comfort this eight year old boy. And I said, dude, all these good luck rocks you've been given to me over the years. Man, they work, dude. They work so good. I've been handing them out to everybody. Your good luck charms, dude. And this little boy is standing in my driveway and he's got no shirt and no shoes on and tears start running down his cheeks. And he said, dad, those aren't for good luck. And they were just for you. And I was like, I didn't know what to say. Right. And he said, that's for you to put in your pocket. And every time you think someone's going to hurt you, touch that rock in there. And that's like me being there to help you fight them back. And I was like, oh my God, you know what? My job was not to infiltrate the Hells Angels or be fucking king shit, Donnie Brasco part two undercover guy. My job was to raise good kids and I'd failed them. Right. And those are, um, <clears throat> those are hard. Uh, you know, like we said earlier, God can forgive you, but man, it's really hard to forgive yourself. Totally. That's heavy stuff, you know, coming from a guy who has, who has boys, you know, and, and really it's a hard. good lesson, you know. I think that's ultimately, um, I think that's ultimately our self-punishment is that, yes, God forgives us our sins. God forgives us our flaws. Um, but you know what, man, we never quite forgive ourselves. And that is like the, the, the nasty gift that we keep giving ourselves. Yeah, for sure. I think you're well on your way, though, to making it all right. You know what I mean? Because I think you're aware of it. And I think self-awareness is part of the, is the first deal. You know? I, you know, I think the circumstances of my life, like trying to like um, suck it up here a little bit. I think the circumstances of my life have all been amazing and great because those like low lows, if you'll look at them honestly, and if you'll look at yourself honestly, man, they're their own blessings. Yeah, They're their own blessings. That situation with Jack, some of the things that happened to me. It may not have seemed like it at the time, but now I can see it's a blessing, man. It was done. Those things happened to change you, to yeah. hopefully like, like see it and hear it and embrace it and understand what it is and do something about it. Don't just sit there and feel sorry for yourself. Become better for it. Right. Not only change you, but now you have the ability to share it with other people and help change them as well. So they don't have to go through the same thing, you know, potentially. Well, yeah. I mean, I think um, ultimately that service mentality uh, that you held when you were active, that all of our soldiers out there, that all of our uh, law enforcement officers and firemen and first responders out there, um, they're all out there for someone else. Yeah. They're all out there for someone else. And that's, um, man, that, that's beautiful, man. I love that. Totally. What are you doing now? Like what's your, your MO now that you're out? Oh, now that I'm out, I, 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 I find a lot of peace. I coach high school football. Awesome. Um, and I, I'll tell you what, I am, uh, I'm not the best high school football coach. I'm not the smartest football coach. Um, I struggle with the same things and I have regrets and try to do the best I can. But um, um, it's easy to say like, oh, I coach high school football because I want to give back to these kids and I want to help like their parents raise good men and I want to teach them to be good football players. 
the truth of it is, is I get so much more out of it than I could ever give them. Yeah. Like being around those kids, I get so much more out of it. Um, I drive across town to go to coach at the school I coach at. And every day I drive across town and I say, thank you, God, for letting me do this, for giving this to me. Yeah. Um, because I get so much out of being around those kids um, and watching them achieve and seeing them struggle and seeing them fail and then trying to help lift them up and then watching them succeed and how happy and how proud they are themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and just watching them become young men. And that is... Uh, that's a huge source of joy in my life there are those kids. And that's like, for me, when you say, what are your goals? Well, like, you know, um, like seeking peace and seeking joy. Yeah. It's pretty simple. It has nothing to do with, you know, how big your car is, how big your house is, where you live, how much money you have. It has nothing to do with that. That doesn't bring you peace and joy. Um, like hopefully trying to have some kind of positive impact on someone. Um, and then being able to find the peace and joy of having touched that. It's huge. man. Yeah, totally. I, um, I was telling somebody the other day that like my football coach growing up, he like, to me, he was like a father figure, you know, he was a, he was like a God to me, you know, and, um, football was such a huge part of my life growing up. It was like, it was the one thing that kind of, I guess, grounded me and gave me like a, a sense of purpose, gave me a sense of discipline and hard work and dedication and camaraderie and teamwork and all the things that, or that I, that I value now as an adult and as a dad. And, uh, so I was, I was married before and I had a son. And so there obviously, you know, with the separation things, get, things are challenging, you know, whatever we have 50, 50 custody. And I try my best to be as involved as I possibly can, um, without like ruffling any feathers and keep the peace and this and that. Well, um, my son wants to play football, you know, and I'm, uh, against it, you know, playing tackle football because I've had six back surgeries and I, I see the damage it did to my body. And, but it's hard to say no to that because I, I know how valuable it was to me, you know, growing up and the lessons that I learned about grit and, and just, just everything, you know, that goes along with that. So he, uh, he's playing flag football and, um, the coach didn't show up, you know, the first week. And, uh, I'm like, oh man, uh, the coach isn't here. And so they, they were asking for volunteers and I didn't raise my hand. I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not getting involved with this. No way. And, uh, so my wife shows up and she's like, why didn't you volunteer? Like, you're like Mr. Football. Like, right. well, what are you, what are you doing? Right. And I was like, yeah, I don't, you know, the other side's here and I just don't want to, you know, get too in, you know, I just don't want to get involved with that. And, you know, I don't even know if Brendan wants me out there and, and this and that. So then when he got home that day, him and my wife both came to me and they're like, no, he wants you to coach. He wants you to step up. So I immediately email the coach and say, Hey, I know you didn't show up. If you need an assistant, I'm, I'm willing to, to help you out. You know, he's actually, you know, why don't you take over the whole team? You're the new head coach. Careful what you ask for. Right. <laughs> so it ended up being a huge blessing. You know what I mean? Right. Because I, uh, I never knew that I was going to like it as much as I did. I mean, obviously coaching kids nowadays is way different than when I was coming up. Of course. Um, so you have to, you know, bend with the times and kind of like go with the flow. Um, but I am still trying to mold these kids into understanding what discipline's all about and hard work. And you know, uh, they want these kids to have fun. But I try to explain that winning is fun, though. Yeah. You know, so yeah. let's let's try and be competitive yeah. at the same time. And so I, I coached my first game last Saturday, and uh, what an awesome experience! We came up short, thirty-two uh, to twenty-six. I think it was the most points they've scored in two seasons. So I was right. like, well, cool, we're we're making some headway now. We should work on the defense. Yeah. Um, but what an awesome experience, man, to, to coach some of these kids. Cause I don't know what their home lives are like or whatever, but at least yeah. for that one day they get me and they get my undivided attention to go out there and truly care about their progress, truly care about what they're doing, you yeah. know, and hopefully leave a lasting impression. I coach kids from all different environments, all yeah. different parts of town, all different family structures. And for 90 minutes or two hours a day, regardless of, you know, how good or bad things might be at home. They have someone there who adores them, yeah. who loves them. And love isn't always like, you know, patting them on the back and telling them they're amazing. Yep. Sometimes love is getting a kick in the ass yeah. um, and, and told, um, you're better than this. I have higher expectations of you than what I just saw or what you did today. Yep. That's love too. Um, I just know this. I know this from being an athlete. I know this from, you know, my professional life. That um, if I'm on a kid, if I if I uh, if I push a kid or if I push him maybe a little bit too hard, I never let that kid leave the field down. Yep. I always make it a point 
to find that kid and make sure, man, you need to understand, man, this is like, people are going to push you, you yeah. know, and someday you're going to have other coaches and someday you're going to go to work and you're going to have a boss and he's going to push you yep. and all those things. And I'm just getting you ready, dude. Yeah, I'm just getting ready. And I have amazing expectations for you. I think that you're going to be incredible. Yeah. But like, you know what? Someone's got to like shove you down that path along, you know, absolutely along the way. I think it's one of those things that they're going to come back and thank you later. I mean, the coach that I had growing up um, in high school, I'm still friends with him. You know, we uh, I reached out to him and maybe 10 or 11 years after high school or something like that. I was already out of the military and I told him, I said, I got to tell you, man, like all the military training and stuff that I did, you're who got me through that training. Because I would think to myself, there's nothing these guys can do to me that my coach didn't already do. And he, I think he may have said something, you know, while I was growing up, but like, if he was yelling at you and he's in your face, to me, it was a sign of affection. It was like, if he cares enough to swear me away, because the guys he's not talking to, he's not going to waste his energy on because he's, these think they're they're a lost cause, you know, I'm not going to mess with them. And so I took that, that, uh, that aggressive, like discipline as like it was love to me it was like okay he loves me enough to 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 lead me in the right direction and um and it's funny too because i look at the guys who started that when i played football with and i don't know if there's a you know correlation or whatever but most of the guys that started when i played football under this same coach all of us are relatively successful in you know terms that yep. society would deem successful um and i was like there has to be something to that yep you know there's um, a common denominator there right and who was it it was that coach right and so we all linked up uh, not too long ago and we all went out to, you know, have a couple of beers or whatever and uh, have dinner and, you know, all got an opportunity to like thank him for like his guidance, his, his leadership and yeah. stuff like that. So I, I hit him up and told him I was coaching my first flag football game and uh, he hit me up this morning. I haven't texted him back yet to ask how it went, you know, so I got to right. tell him, you know, well, you know, people ask me like, Jay, who, like, who's your heroes? Right. And I think, um, obviously I admire and respect, you know, people from your community in the military. Right. Um, I have uh, respect and admiration for the first responder world, but really my heroes um, are teachers and coaches, right? Those are my heroes. Um, We pay them next to nothing. Um, We don't give them much support. Um, You know, we basically, you know, our teachers, we give them a piece of chalk and a blackboard. And then we ask them to like check lockers for drugs, check backpacks for drugs uh, check kids' heads for lice, like examine their bodies for bruising, like monitor their t-shirts and monitor their clothing and make sure that they're uh, socially acceptable. Right. Um, we ask them to socialize our kids and to teach them manners and to teach them respect and teach them all those things. And then we give them a few pennies a year to do it. And then we turn our kids over to them and say, hey, make 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 my son, make my daughter amazing. Right. Get them in college. They want a scholarship. Yeah. Um, you, know, make them, you know, make them successful in life. Um, man, some of the most unsung heroes out there, teachers and coaches, man. And they do it and they do it under the radar. And, you know, um, they don't get, uh, appreciation or love and respect that they deserve. Um, and you know what? It's, it's like me and you, um, they know they're not going to, and that alarm clock goes off in the morning and they put their feet on the ground and they go to work and they go to work for us. Yep. They're actually working when they're taking our kids, they're working for us too. Yeah. I actually segues me into the next question that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast. If you had one person or multiple people, it doesn't matter, or one book or multiple books that inspired you the most your entire life, whether it be personal life, work life, family life, whatever, what would that person be? And uh, who would that person be? And what would that book be and why? You know, uh, that, that's a, such a tough question because there's just so many amazing and inspiring people and stories and books. But I'll tell you something, a book I read as a kid. And it has stuck with me. There's a book called I Am Third by Gail Sayers. And if you're familiar with Brian Song, the Brian oh, Song yeah. movie, the Gail Sayers, Brian Piccolo story, um, which like I Am Third, which basically says God is first, my friends are second, and I am third. Um, and it's just, it's such a beautiful story, you know, of it's a sports story, but it's also yeah. like a, it's a human story and it's a relationship story and it's a friendship story. Um, and it's simple and it's sweet and it's heartbreaking and it's, you know, all those things that we want in our entertainment, man, it makes you laugh. It makes you cry. Yeah. Um, man, but that, that book, um, I probably read that in second or third grade. Um, 
And when I read it, I wrote a letter, a hand wrote a letter and put it in the mail, like old school, like take an envelope, put a stamp on it, right? And send a letter. (laughs) Just dated Um, yourself. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And I sent a letter to Gail Sayers. Oh, wow. And um, one day, you know, I come home and like, you know, I'm a kid, I come up from school and my mom's like, hey, there's an envelope here for you. Well, kid, you know, you don't get mail when you're a kid. (laughs) And I got an autographed picture from Gail Sayers and it just said 2J, peace, Gail Sayers. And over the course of 57 years and all the things from my childhood, there's one item that I've kept with me that survived all that, survived everything was that autograph from Gail Sayers. That's a trip. Yeah, right? But for me, that would be like, you you have a fan for life. You know what I mean? Like that's that's invaluable. You know, he took the time out of his day to do that. Yeah. Kind of like, uh, I, have, I had a book that I bought, American Soldier by uh, General Tommy Franks. And um, when I was in England, he, um, he coined me while I was there and a four-star general coining an airman is kind of a big deal. And uh, because when they come to England, their personal security detail uh, teams for whatever reason, cannot have their guns on them. I don't know the whole story behind that, whatever, but they leave most of their ammunition and stuff on the base or on the, um, on the, the plane because they're not stationed there. Sure. So the cops that are there are um, tasked with doing the protection. So I followed him everywhere and uh, did all of his protection. And at the end of that protection detail, uh, he handed me a coin and said, you know, take care of yourself, Biggin. And he gave me a big old hug, you know? And um, so he left on the transition of PCSing out of England, um, I lost that coin. I couldn't find it. I was like, Oh shit. And, uh, it's one of my most prized possessions, you know, and I was super excited about it. And, um, so I bought his book and I wrote him, I wrote him a letter and, and just explained to him like how important that was to me, you know, like getting hugged even by a four star general was huge. And, uh, and the coin, and I told him uh, that I lost it in transition, whatever he didn't have any more, but he sent his book back and he signed it and wrote me a letter inside the book. And to this day, all the moves, you know, I've been married and divorced and this and that. I've, I have never lost it. I still have it. You know, I, I think that's a great example. And, and like my Gail Sarah story it yeah. is an example of how, um, you know, a big shot, someone we admire can impact the common man. Totally. You know, and, and I talk, when I talk to kids, I'm like, you know what, if you're the big man on campus, you're the big shot, you're the guy with the scholarship, you're the prettiest girl, you're the head cheerleader, you're the captain of the basketball team, and all the love and adoration comes on you. You know what, but there's kids in this school who are lost. Yeah. There's kids here who come to school and they're confused and they don't feel like they fit in and um, they might not have a lot of friends. I'm not asking you as the big shot to make this person your best friend. But when you're passing them in the hallway, if you say, hey, man, what's up? If you see them in class and you say, like, man, like, what do you think of this math class? I hate math, right? Whatever it is, your interaction with them, you can change that person's life. That's how simple it is. Just a kind word can literally change someone's life. Yeah. But like, be big enough to do that. Totally. Be big enough to say, hey, man, you know what? Um, this kid who's... Uh, perceived as the weirdo, as the nerd, as the oddball, whatever, man, if you as this campus superstar can say, Hey man, how's it going today? That kid's going to take that home and he's going to, and he's going to embrace it. You're going to have a fan forever. Yep. Like you have general Franks, yep. like you'll be his fan forever. Gail Sayers, I'll be his fan forever. Like, man, why would you not want to do that? Why would you not want to create a fan of yourself forever? By yep. just doing something simple and kind. Yep. That's how easy it is. Totally. I had that conversation with uh, my son, Brendan. He had his back to school night and he had a, uh, there was a girl that was trying to talk to him when we were there and he was kind of, I can tell he was kind of ignoring her a little bit. And I was like, Hey, what's up with that, man? And he's like, ah, oh, you know, she's gross. She like picks her boogers or whatever the case may be. And I said, dude, have you ever thought, man, that he, well, she annoys everyone. I said, have you ever thought how she feels about that dude? Have you ever yeah. thought like maybe yeah. like she like probably feels like an outcast dude. And the fact that like, she's trying to talk to you, she's trying to get your attention and you yeah. can't, you blow her off. Yeah. I'm not saying you need to be your best friend, man, yeah. but just go to her and just, just acknowledge her. Just say hello, man. Yeah. You know, and maybe she's weird. Maybe she has some mental issues going on. Who knows, dude, yeah. but you don't need to be a dick, you know? And uh, I'm not scolding you. I'm just telling you that you can make a difference. You know, what an impact to yeah. say like, Hey man, how you doing today? Right. That's simple. Like, I like your t-shirt. Yeah. 
That's how easy it is. Totally. I mean, because I think that was one of my regrets growing up because I played football my whole life and you get kind of like grouped into a group of guys, you know, the jock and you, you know, you're this and then you're that. And even from the outside, people looking in would be like, oh, he's just one of those stupid jocks, you know, dates, cheerleaders and, and whatever. Um, but at the core of me, the core of like my heart, I never was that guy. I mean, I was a good football player and, and yeah, I ran in those circles cause it's just, sure. I mean, just of proximity. Course. Um, but my heart was never a clicky dude. Like I just wasn't into that. I always wanted people to feel included. And, yeah. um, if ever, uh, which I can't think of very many instances, maybe one or two where I may have had a crossword with somebody, or I may have said something that I regretted. I've gone and made those right. Like yeah. say, man, I'm, I apologize. You know, I was out of character or, or whatever. And I, I apologize, man. I'm sorry. I've recently done that. It, like within the last couple months, you know, like I said, I'm 57 years old as an adult. I've looked back at people that, um, I was unfair to, or, um, mistreated or, 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 just just didn't treat the way they deserved right. and just basically reached out to him and said man i'm you know what i'm sorry i regret that i hope you can forgive me if you can't i'll have to live with that yeah. but i'm sorry yeah. uh, man and that you'd be amazed at how far that goes oh for sure i never there was one in particular um with a girl that i was friends with i mean we were uh, acquaintances and i had made a comment to her about her weight or something like that and told her she could be a linebacker or something something to that effect and she made she told me about that comment i don't remember making it i was a kid you know right she told me about the comment and i uh i held on to that and i felt terrible about it i was like wow that here we are years later and she's bringing up a comment that i made that i don't even remember right. as a kid and it made a lasting impression on her right so about two years ago i sent her a message and said i want to let you know like i've been thinking about this for a long time and i'm so sorry you know i'm, I'm from the bottom of my heart i'm sorry that was not never want to make anybody feel less than and uh I failed you. You know, I'm sorry. Never knew what the response was going to be, but she, I never knew if she would even respond. And she did. And it was a heartfelt message, you know, and, uh, and it feels good. Yeah. It feels good to get yeah. that, to get that off, you know, yeah. off my chest and to know that she knows that I care, you know, enough to do that. And I think people in general are very, very quick to forgive yeah. when you, when they get a sincere apology, people are very quick to forgive. Just, that's just the human factor in us. Right. Totally. Um, the next question I want to ask you that I, that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast is if you had one lesson that you could teach either a younger Jay or just somebody that's coming up in the world um, that you could save them the heartache that maybe you experienced growing up, one of the biggest lessons that you could teach someone, what would that lesson be and why? Man, a lesson. I like the way I look at myself. I always look at myself uh, like critically first. So I'm like, okay, what did I screw up that I would say is like, don't do this because I screwed this up. Right. I think um, actually it's something maybe that I, that I got right is that, um, and, and I think, uh, you know, we, we touched on it is that um, be, um, be happy and be encouraging and be excited for other people's success and achievement. It takes nothing away from your own. Oh, it yeah. doesn't diminish yours one bit. And it go, you know, it goes back, actually, we were talking about coaching these kids. Um, yeah. And I told them like, like individually, there's kids who are going to be amazing. They're going to go play in college. There's some kids that probably are, you know, going to play professionally. Um, but when we as a group can be as excited for other people's achievement and success as we can for our own, that's when we got it figured out. That's when we, as a team, as a group, are going to be amazing. Um, you look at kids who um, they do, you know, they make a play and their entire team and the bench is celebrating for them because they're that kid, they're that personality versus the kid who scores a touchdown and does his dance and celebrates all by himself. That says a lot, man. That says a lot about that person. Absolutely. Um, so I think, um, and, and, and I've, it, I didn't really experience this much until I um, found some notoriety, maybe some, uh, some attention was on me when I was, you know, like, like, like after my book and after some of the things that have come, yeah. um, I've really seen, um, 
people that I never thought that they had this in them. I've seen like jealousy in them. Yeah. And I've seen um, where they're, you know, they're, they're just, they're not, they're not happy for me. Right. And I'm like, man, I never did anything but support you. I never did anything but encourage you. Like, I want you to, you know, go make a billion dollars. You know, when you buy your yacht and when you have your helicopter, man, call me. I want to go for a ride. I want to celebrate this with you. I want you to fly the space shuttle. I want you to be the president. I want you to be do amazing things and I will be happy for you. Um, man, that's huge. Yeah. Um, and, and it's equally as crushing when um, you want or someone who you want to please, someone who you want to be proud of you refuses to give that to you. Yeah. No, that's huge. And it's funny that you bring that up because I've actually been talking to a lot of people about that lately where I see like the more like podcasting that I'm doing, the, the, the uh, podcast that I'm doing, uh, the circles that I'm running in, there's a lot of like uh, cattiness. There's a lot of people that will talk shit on other people. There's a lot of like gossiping. There's a lot of like, and I, I told my wife and I told my closest friends, like, I will never be a part of that. Never. I don't want to be associated with it. It's not who I am as a person. And it's for that very reason, because for me, I want people to, to succeed. Yeah. I want people to be successful. And who am I to, to talk shit on somebody else's success or to try and, and minimize what they're doing? You know what I mean? Cause I think everyone in life is, you're trying to find your way. We all are, you know, I think there's people who, um, in the world who are insecure, who, um, when they see someone achieve and when they realize, man, I'm never going to do that. The only way I keep up with that person is to cut them down and bring them down to my level. Cause I can never raise to theirs. Right. Man. Um, that'd be a miserable way to go through life. Yeah. I think, I don't remember who told, I, I think it's a quote somewhere about like the, the people who are bringing you down are never the people who are doing more than you. It's always the people beneath you. And, uh, and I think that's very true. You know what I mean? And I think if you just stay in your lane and just keep doing what you're doing and kind of like shut it out, you know, because I mean, even like I'm, I'm no big shot, you know what I mean? I'm doing a podcast. I'm traveling all over the country doing it, but I get DMS and messages and stuff from people. And most of it's positive, but some of it's very negative, sure, you know, sure. people just hating on what you're doing. And it's like, why do you care? Yeah. You know, yeah, you're not doing what I'm doing. So why do you care what I'm doing? Well, you know? you, I get those two. I get those trolls and I get the, the negative personal messages and the, you know, like I, I, when I get those, they almost bring a smile to my face. I'm thinking like, how miserable are you that you took the time to find a way to contact me and then to compose a message to me to tell me how much you hate me? How miserable are you? Right. Like, like there wasn't something better on TV to watch today than this. Cause that would have been more productive for you than to like, send me this message, which I read, I laugh at, I smile and I delete. That's right. the impact you had on me. Right. It's a trip. What's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, it's like, I'm pretty easy to find. I have a website. It's uh, jdobbins.com, J-A-Y-D-O-B-Y-N-S.com. Um, there's an email associated with it. You know, I get messages all the time. I try to respond to all the messages. I do respond to all the messages I get. Um, sometimes even the bad ones, right. sometimes even the nasty ones. Yeah. Um, um, you know, more like, like even the nasty ones, like all the time, I'll say something back and I'm like, I, I don't fuel the fire. I don't yeah. fan the flames, you know, but I'll say something back. Right. Um, but like my books are there and some of the story is, and, and some of my speaking, I do some public speaking and, um, um, I do, I actually do a lot of public speaking in, in the, in the world of, uh, like mindset for law enforcement yeah. and, um, and, uh, you know, like, uh, suicide in, in the first responder world is epidemic. Oh yeah. Like it is in the military world too. Absolutely. Um, suicide has become in today's culture, uh, a way that some people, um, when overwhelmed, choose to solve their problems. And it's, you know, it's a permanent, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yep. And, um, we're trying to expose that. We're trying to bring attention to that. And, um, so there's some stuff there on that and, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm easy to find. I'm easy to awesome. find, you know, hopefully the hell's angels aren't listening to that. I'm easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> and last, last thing I want to ask you is how do you want to be remembered? Oh man, I would, um, ultimately, um, in hindsight, I don't know if I'll ever achieve this. I would like to be remembered as someone who was um, a good son, a good husband, 
a good father, uh, a good friend, a good partner, um, and someone who um, like put others before himself. Um, I'm very willing to like let anybody climb on my shoulders to get to the next level if that's if that's what they need to do. Um, someone who was uh, like willing to uh, uh, go against um, go against the grain when I need to. Yeah. Someone who was willing to stand up to the bullies and and uh, and do it sometimes when it was unpopular to do it. Um, and like I said, just someone who um, hopefully can can lead a life or at least begin to lead a life or restore to a life that that pleases God and that um, uh, gives him you know all the all the credit uh, for every good thing that I've ever had, ever will have, ever done, ever will do. Thank you, man. I can't tell you enough, man, how much I appreciate you being willing to do this podcast. Right on, man. I'm honored and flattered. And, totally and awesome, man. Thank you to your audience for listening to us and listening to our conversation. I hope they enjoyed it and maybe pull a little piece out of it somewhere that they can make them smile or think about something. They'll be digging it for sure. Yeah, right on. Thank you so much, brother. All the best, man. All much right, man. love. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.